Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for uh, inviting me to, uh, to this event. I'm, uh, thanks to Ceci for this, and uh, really glad to be spending this uh, time with you here today. So, Ceci did a fantastic job in introducing Internet of Things this morning, and actually touched upon some of the case studies where uh, it has started to impact our lives in a, in a personal way. What I hope to do today is to discuss a little bit more in detail about the Internet of Things, uh, both from a technology perspective, as well as introduce you uh, to the industrial side of the Internet of Things. Nimble Wireless, we are specifically focused on IoT systems uh, for the industrial side of things. So I want to expose you to that, uh, the hidden potentials there and the enormous uh, changes that are happening there. Before I go into that, I want to take a trip down the memory lane and uh, show you this screenshot. How many of you recognize this particular application screenshot? Show of hands. Anybody else? Anybody else? I really feel like I'm getting old. This is Mosaic, the first internet browser, or rather the first popular internet browser that was released in 1993. This application single-handedly opened up the internet for popular consumption. I still remember the time I was in my graduate school when I downloaded this uh, software and started clicking through the buttons and you could go from just sitting in one corner of the world, you could be getting into the uh, servers, information of other universities or labs around the world just by, you could be sitting in the US and looking at some of the research being done in Japan. It was just fascinating to have that power in, 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 your, in your fingertips. The internet was there before. There were applications such as Gopher, MailChat, or FTP clients, and many other chat rooms and things like that. But for the first time, this application actually opened it up for everybody in, in a manner that was easy, and the information explosion came from there. So the internet that we know today actually started somewhere here in this application. When this application was started, we did not even have the conception of like something like Twitter or LinkedIn or Google. We knew that something great was happening. We, we just, it was amazing at the time for technologists as well as the new uh, non-technologists coming into this and seeing this particular uh, application as action. But we, didn't, we couldn't quite comprehend what, where this was going. We knew something was great was happening. So, internet, as we know, is all about connecting people. It was about information created by people, it was information created for people, and largely about people. There was a lot of research institutions going on, a lot of information being shared. That was the connecting, uh, it was, internet was about connecting people. And it was, now we are at a place where Twitters and Facebooks have come to a point where in some parts of the world, they're actually creating revolutions. We did not know this would happen, but now, 20 plus years after that, we are talking about a significant shift in the way Internet is operating, and this is what Internet of Things is all about. Internet of Things is aims to connect your physical world to the Internet. It's going to bring not only people, it's going to bring every simple thing or physical things on the Internet. And when I am saying that it's not only really connecting, when things start talking to each other, amazing things are happening. And this is happening both on the consumer side of the world as well as on the industrial side of the world. And on the consumer side, Sassi gave some very good examples of it. I want to give you another example. There's a company in the US which is called Adhere Tech. It took a small pill bottle, you know, uh, the bottle where we have medicines. Now, one of the common problems 
then a medicine is given to uh, aging parents or aging people is that they forget to take this pill. What this company did was they put a small intelligence in this small bottle that actually glows. If you forget to take a pill for, let's say you forget to take a pill after the lunch, it glows in blue. And it reminds them there is something going on. Some, they have to take the pill. If they still forget to do it, it gets, gets to the next step where it informs its, their doctors, hey, they have forgotten to take their pills. And now that they can communicate with the parent or they communicate with the patient and ask them, hey, have you taken the pill or, or something going on? What is the delay? Do we have to send somebody over? Is everything okay? Now that is a very, very important step towards from just knowing, just connecting the uh, thing to the internet to making the thing communicate to the other people. Now based on this, we can create some incredible amount of applications, which we'll see in, in, in some of the case studies I'm going to be talking about now. So the, the whole concept of connecting internet or connecting things to the internet is going to take the internet as we know now to a really profound transformation. So what are, why is this a big deal? I mean, what's what's a big deal about things? How many things are there? This, this was a report that was uh, provided by Cisco some time back. It turns out there are billions of things that are going to be on the internet in, by 2020. The prediction is about 50 billion, give or take a few billion, doesn't matter. Depending on how you count it and uh, who you ask, these numbers could change. But somewhere in 2005, the number of devices connecting on the internet exceeded the number of people on the internet. And that was a significant event. And today, the estimators are about 25 billion things are connected on the internet. Let's think about it a little bit. What, what are these things? Even in my home, I, I have three laptops, three air conditioners, power units, some connected uh, TVs or uh, my car is connected, my security door, all these things could potentially be connected. So if you start counting the kind of things that you could connect to the internet and then derive value out of it is enormous. We have not even started counting what's on the industrial side of things. In the industries, every asset is being uh, tracked. Every asset is being on the, on the internet. Coffee machines, uh, containers, shipping assets, trash cans, Everything is being connected, and there is a reason for connecting all these things. And, and it will start to become clear when I talk about some of the IoT case studies. So this whole number of things that are going to be the internet is mind-boggling. I'm sure you're all talking about, you're, you're aware of the billions of photos that Facebook is today uploading on us. We're talking about terabytes of data. This is nothing. We're going to be going into zettabytes and pentabytes all kinds of numbers that we can't even comprehend in, in today's number. So it, while connecting these internet of uh, these billions of devices, we are also going to have significant challenges. We'll talk about that as well today. But here's the secret. And, and uh, we've been in this business for some time, and our experience is that it's not the number of devices that really matter. What really matters is extracting the intelligence, in extracting the value out of these devices and creating the applications that solve real world problems that is really matters. Okay. So what if we have billions of devices? You may really care about maybe a dozens of devices that if you are in a consumer or if you are in an industrial world, you may care about thousands of devices. But eventually you have to be able to derive the value out of those information. And that is what is going to matter. And if you're thinking today, a typical smartphone user, you're using 15 applications, just believe me, you're going to have a, even a, another fold of increase where you're going to have a lot more applications that are going to be giving you the value on this uh, device. Some of the some of the applications, even as he alluded to, finding your parent where they are or informing how the welfare of your baby, everything is going to be important. All right, so where is it going to be impacting, okay? Every single field that we know of today is going to be is, is getting impacted today and is going to be transformed by Internet of Things. I can guarantee you that. I can pretty much give you an example in each and every one of these from, from my own experience today. 
consumer, industrial, environment, medical, agriculture, retail, automotive, everything is getting transformed. It is transformed in a way that we cannot even imagine today. And largely you can divide this into consumer internet of things and industrial internet of things. The concepts are very similar, they have different dynamics to them, they have different cost structures to them, they have different uh, scale to them, they have different uh, uh, values that are being derived of them, but largely there is a consumer of uh, Internet of Things and industrial Internet of Things. General Electric, for example, has coined the term industrial Internet. Cisco calls this Internet of Everything. I'm sure there may be other marketing terms that are going to be invented, but eventually it is all about connecting the physical things to over the Internet. All right. So now we have now we are we know that it's going to be uh, all the business are going to be connected. But why are they really going to care? I mean, if, if you are if there are any business analysts here sitting and figuring out how am I going to sell this to the businesses? Or how am I going to convince that somebody is going to need something like this? Typically, it falls under three buckets. A business that is considering implementing Internet of Things has to convince itself of the ROI one or more of these categories. Either it's a cost reduction, and or it's a revenue increase, and or it's a compliance reason. Cost reduction, I'll give you an example of that. So a company in the US which is actually uh, managing trash cans, uh, they have this problem of thousands of trash cans spread over the world, spread over the geographical region. And they have to send people to empty the trash cans. Now, when you send somebody over, it typically takes maybe an hour or two of drive and, an hour, and the fuel cost and the labor cost and all those things. But 30% of the time, they found out when they go to the trash can, there's really no trash. It's a waste of journey for them. So they started putting sensors in these trash cans to understand when they have to go there. And based on the number of trash cans in the particular region, they started optimizing the routes of these people who are collecting the trash. And immediately they saw a huge cost reduction in their uh, operational activity. That's just one example of how a cost reduction it happens in input in and out things. Revenue increase. Another company which has a uh, which sells cases, big cases that are transported, very valuable assets being transported in these cases. They said, all right, I want to be able to track these assets, tra track these uh, cases as they are being transported from one point of the country to another point. And they turned around and sold that information to their customers saying, look, you can track your expensive electronic or medical assets that is going from California to Texas almost on an hourly basis. And their customers were willing to pay for that. And that's a revenue increase. That's just one example of how revenue increase comes up. Compliance. In, for example, in food industry, um, you have to have your uh, temperature sensitive goods maintained at a particular temperature range for FDA compliance, for example, as in the US case. So some of those things cannot be done, or at least for compliance reasons, you have to have those records and monitored automatically. And that's another reason for uh, businesses to adopt in and other things. So new business models are being derived. Some of the predictions are that Trillions of dollars are going to be generated because of new solutions around Internet of Things. So in all these cases, when you're talking to your customers or you're thinking about Internet of Things, it has to be convincing in one of these categories, one or more of these categories. Otherwise, it's not going to be Internet. It, it, this is probably true for many, many business cases, but I just want to focus on this thing because Internet of Things sometimes takes on this uh, a geeky, you know, uh, uh, it's a cool thing to have, but when it comes down to the business values, we have to worry about these things. All right, so now we understand there are, every business is going to be impacted by IoT, and we understand what the business drivers have to be. Let's look at what is driving this from a technology perspective. So for some of you who may have heard about uh, communication from machines, this has been happening for quite some time. Even back to 70s, there are examples of communications from machines. You may have heard about SCADA as a system. But the difference now is that the pervasive nature of this thing is mind-boggling. And there are these are three reasons that is actually driving this from a technology perspective. Today, the sensors 
and the computing is so small and so inexpensive that you can pretty much have a sensor even on your cloak. See, the, I can have a very powerful computer in, in, in a stamp size. You can embed these computing elements in many, many things without them being obtrusive or, or visible at all. So the first important dynamics we have come to is, is the sensors or the computing is so small, so inexpensive that now it starts to become economically viable to achieve some of these things. The next is the wireless networks. Even five years before, five years ago, or even seven years ago, the wireless was still expensive. Now we have many flavors of wireless, Bluetooth, Zigbee, you know, other kinds of uh, uh, white space, uh, Wi-Fi. We'll, we'll get into more details on the uh, uh, Wi-Fi or, or the uh, tem uh, wireless related technologies. But this is making it easy to communicate or easy to connect these physical things onto the internet. There are many variants of this, we'll, we'll talk about it shortly. And of course, the cloud and big data. As I mentioned, these are going to be creating gobs and gobs of data, and now we are having the tools to manage these data and generate some intelligence out of it, which we could not have done even five years ago. There is Hadoop, there is Cassandra, there is Apache Spark. These are the technical tools that we have that are actually enabling the uh, adoption of these things. So these it's kind of a perfect storm that some of these ideas are coming together to enable the implementation of IoT today. All right, so now we know the business, now we know what are the drivers, now we know we can do it. Let's peel back the layers. Really, what is it in an IoT uh, framework? So, in any IoT implementation, the first thing is on the sensors. So you're taking a physical world, and you have to start worrying about how do we equip this with the sensors that is that are needed. And the first is you it, you may be putting a temperature sensor, humidity sensor, light sensor, motion sensor, whatever it is. That's the sensor, and all those sensors have to be connected into a network, and that's the first layer. And next comes the uh, gateway layer, you have to get that information onto the internet somehow. And that's where the second layer called the aggregation or the gateway layer comes in. This is typically called the front end of the system. In any internet of IoT system, this is called the front end of the system. Next comes the back end. Once you get it on the internet, now you have to bring it back to the storage layer, where you are storing huge amounts of layer, you have to process the uh, information, you have, you are generating uh, analytics out of it, you are generating intelligence out of it. And then the last layer of applications, that is the consumer-facing consumption layer, where you are showing the visualizing the data. So this, these are the five layers typically you have to worry about in all the IoT systems. And the important thing that many do not realize is the IoT is the entire system. It is not just the hardware, it's not just the sensors, it's not just the application, it's not just the storage. Unless all your layers work together, your IoT will not work. This is the this is the trick part, and this is what is challenging in any many IoT systems today. All right. So this, any any uh, uh, we can get deeper into this. Uh, each one of these layers is a topic in its own, uh, but this is, gives you an overview of how to think about the IoT system in in any uh, construction. It's not easy to implement it though. Okay. Each one of these layers. At the sensor layer, we have the concern about the form factors and the power consumption. All these things, many things that you're going to say, they don't have power. These sensors have to operate on battery for many, many years together. We have cases where we have uh, hardware devices working for six years, seven years, even ten years in without battery and, and with battery without the external power. Now the form factor, and form factor is also important, and, and think about cases where uh, uh, one of our customer came to us and said they wanted to actually track their um, uh, chainsaw, you know, the machinery that is with the vibration. Imagine the vibration the hardware has to go through, imagine the heat that has to go through, and you still have to operate within that environment. So deciding on the sensor form factor, deciding on the uh, battery considerations is, is the first challenge that you have to solve. It could still be solved. Next comes the network and protocols. I have another slide, I'll talk about it. There's a very big chat. I'll come to it in a minute. Data processing. You have to be able to handle huge amounts of data. And you have to handle, get some information out of it, some intelligence out of it. 
And device managers is another big problem. When you build a system with one thing connected on the internet, that's easy. When you take it to 10, you're going to the next step. When you, when you have to go to 100 and thousands and millions, now you have a device management problem on your hands. Next comes the reliability. It is extremely important that we have 24-7 reliability for all these IoT systems. You know, if, if LinkedIn grows down for an hour or two, it doesn't matter. But if a baby monitor or a health monitor is, goes down for six hours, we have a serious problem. So reliability is, is a very, very important topic in, uh, in, the, uh, in IoT world. Reliability and fault tolerance. <coughs> Privacy and security. This is still a very huge problem in IoT. It's, uh, today we have come to realize or come to trust our banking uh, software, for example, to say it is secure, I can do my e-commerce or banking online. But in the IoT world, it's still not there yet. We have huge problems to solve in the IoT world. So building an IoT system at scale is still complex. It's, still, it's not an easy task. There are many, many challenges to worry about, and as I mentioned, the entire chain has to work really well for the, for the IoT to yield values. And security and device management is still the hardest. This, this comes directly from our experience of building large systems, large IoT systems and deployments. So when you are having thousands of units where you cannot have somebody going and pressing a reset button, you have to be able to control the device remotely. You have to have communication to it. You have to be able to change the profile of the device uh, remotely. Device management and configuration is a very challenging issue in IoT. And of course, security is, is very, very important, particularly those that security that deal with both consumer level as well as some secure industrial installations. Okay? Now, let's get a talk about wireless uh, itself. So there are various wireless options available for connecting the things over to the internet. And I've heard arguments that this is the best wireless, or that, that's the best wireless. That's usually not the case. Every wireless technology invented or shown in this slide has been invented or designed for certain trade-offs and certain contexts and certain amount of power, bandwidth, latency, and all those things. So understanding your system and what you want to accomplish and then matching it to the specific Wi-Fi technology is very important. One or more of these may fit, but make sure you understand what the context is. What is the bandwidth I need to achieve? What is the latency I need to achieve? What is the fault tolerance I need to achieve? Does it have a range I need to worry about? All these things have different characters. This, this itself could be a complete uh, uh, talk or a discussion about which one to choose. But that's, that's a very key decision that you will be making. Most IoT systems are built with wireless technologies. Very few that I'm aware of are actually built on wire technologies, but it is another possibility as well. All right, protocols. Now, as you all know, HTTP is a common structure by which the internet works. We have decided on that. It, it's, everybody understands that. All the servers understand that for exchanging information. It's very easy to, it, it, it's, it's the standard. And, and on top of it is running on TCP, IP, and whatnot. But in the internet of things, we have a problem. There are many standards. There is no one standard. There is COAB, there is uh, DDS, there is NQTT, there is LWM2, XMPP, and whatnot. And this is still evolving. And which one do you choose? How do you uh, pick the right one? Is it interoperable? That's another challenge that you will face when you're looking at Internet of Things. This, because of this varying or, or, or fragmentation in the protocol, many of the IoT systems are today built in silos. It's an unfortunate fact, but that's what is being done. Eventually, this is going to get standardized to one or two uh, protocols, and uh, hopefully we'll have the IoT that interoperates between the things. And I'm, I'm guessing consumer side of things may have one type of uh, a protocol, and an internet and, and the industrial side may have another uh, protocol. But nevertheless, it's important to be aware of these protocol standards. All right, so hopefully now I've given you an idea about the technical layer, the business layer of it. I want to talk to you about some of the case studies and, and wrap this up in a, in a nice book. Now, all the case studies that I'm going to talk to you today are real-life case studies, something that we have built before in the past four, five to six years. And these are all operational now, and the customers have paid for that, so there is real value. There is no uh, concern about is this even possible or not. So I'm, I'm really 
proud to present some about our four case studies here today. The first one is a very simple one. This is, uh, by the way, all these case studies are going to be on the industrial side of things. So this company in India uh, owns thousands of heavy equipments, and their problem was they lease these heavy equipments to their customers, and sometimes they cannot recover these leased equipments. Let's say in about six months' time frame, when the lease period is over, and these equipments are many, many tens of thousands of dollars worth of assets, and they have to worry about their asset utilization and asset turnover and all the economics that goes with it. So what they wanted to do was they wanted to put a tracking device in each one of these equipments. And oh, by the way, the tracking device has to operate for two plus years on battery. Imagine having your cell phone operating for two years on battery. That's what the challenge of this one is. And it has to be installed in a way that nobody can remove it, nobody can see it. So what we had to do was we had to put a tracking device that's a very small sensor GPS tracking device on all these things. We had to optimize the battery life on it. We had to optimize for thousands plus uh, equipment GPS tracking and monitor all those things and provide the analytics for where they are, how they are performing, are they within a particular geographical region they are or not. If they are outside a state boundary, we have to alert them. All these things are happening in this Internet of Things. And they have integrated this to, to their uh, ERP system to analyze their uh, revenue flow, their contract numbers, uh, their asset utilization, all those things. So this immediately, this gave them a few percentages of increase in the asset utilization and that made crores, crores of revenue in, in the difference. Another complicated example, this is about monitoring telecom assets. Telecom towers is your regular cell phone tower that you may see here. Every telecom tower actually has a complicated set of equipments underneath them. They have energy devices, uh, DC power meters, AC energy meters, they have solar panels, they have di uh, diesel generators, batteries, some of them have even wind power. Their challenge was these systems were installed in as remote places as Sam, West Bengal, Sundarbans, and just to get to them, it takes about a day of journey. But they have to provide 99.9% .9 uptime and all these things. And they have to monitor the assets are operating in a, in, a, in a proper manner. And they have hundreds of such sites to be operating. And with the Internet of Things, we provided sensors of various things that attach to these things and collect the information over, over the GPRS uh, network and provide the entire remote monitoring reliability uh, with the reliable infrastructure. And in about 500 or so towers are being managed by as simple as half a dozen people sitting in a very small room. This would not have been possible even five years ago or six years ago. And Internet of Things has enabled a completely new revenue model for them in providing the service with the reliability that we are talking about. Okay? All right, this is, this is one of my favorites. Now, how many of you know of uh, Ibaco ice creams in Chennai? Fantastic. Would you believe that if I tell you that all the IPACO ice creams are monitored? <coughs> Today I was just uh, sitting here and looking at, uh, you know, in my cell phone, the uh, IPACO ice cream in uh, ECR Road. I could pinpoint the cake freezer in that store was at comfortable minus 20 degrees Celsius. This, this company came to us and said, we are a premium ice cream brand, and we need to maintain our ice creams at a very strict temperature range. What can you do for us? We looked at all these things, and we attached sensors in each and every store. By the way, you will not be able to see the sensors. They are very small or very invisible, uh, and, and hidden underneath that. So we put sensors in all the ice cream, uh, ice cream cases, cake freezers, and uh, other, other storage units where they collect the information and they send it to their operational team. If anything is deviated even by one degree Celsius, they will get an alert immediately. And why do they have to do it? Sometimes power goes down, diesel generator shuts down, and their ice cream uh, melts away, and the next day the guy comes over, he has to throw away everything. That's a huge loss. Okay? And so this was uh, very, very interesting. So the next time you're there to take a scoop of ice cream, remember there is an IoT behind the scene that is enhancing your experience. Okay, there was another news about a month, uh, about a month ago. In a first, forecasting helps TMEB make most of wind power. 
This problem was another interesting one. Uh, the whipped energy in uh, Tamil Nadu, which is one of the, I think, I believe, uh, one of the top two states of wind energy, they could not predict the wind energy, the is production of wind energy in a consistent manner. They could, they, they know there is going to be wind, maybe next week, maybe the uh, uh, week after that, but they couldn't know what it is going to be 15 minutes from now. Because of this, they couldn't sell the wind energy to the Tamil Nadu Electricity Board. And because of this, they, they were relying on a coal energy, which is obviously environmentally very, uh, very bad. So they came to us and said, all right, I need to know in real time what is happening to my wind energy. I need to be able to predict it within 15 minutes accuracy. So we had, we put in, um, sensors in all the wind farms. And they are starting to implement this. And with the information getting literally hundreds of sensors per uh, per windmill coming in and telling them in the next 15 minutes, combine that with the predicted model of a weather, weather in the region, they could pinpoint how much wind energy they could produce. Imagine that. And because of this, your, the, uh, your, your availability of the wind power is phenomenal and, and you are, actually can balance the wind energy against other forms of energy. And oh, by the way, with the information that you're collecting, you can also do predictive maintenance on these wind farms. Before they fail, you could have the right person sitting there and, and fixing these wind farms. So this is another example of IoT in action in the, in the, the wind, uh, windmill and or wind energy within uh, Tamil Nadu. And by the way, TNEB probably does not recognize IoT as a term at all. They don't know that. In many cases, this is what's happening. We are looking at a transformation in our industrial implementation without even knowing that IoT is taking over today. All right? So what is it going to be in another 10 or 15 years? And this is an interesting quote. The most profound technologies are those that disappear. Another 15 years, we will not be talking about IoT as if it's a separate topic. It will be diffused in our environment so much that we cannot comprehend living without it. We'll just, it'll just be there for us. It'll just be adding value for us. We'll be consuming it in applications. The IoT wave has just begun. It is taking shape in many forms today. Uh, hopefully, I've convinced you of some of the implementation in the industrial world. And there are a lot more examples in the consumer world as well. You know, just like it. Our children cannot comprehend a world without Google or how it was before internet was. Even we cannot comprehend that. So IoT or the internet that we know of today is going through such profound transformation that it's going to give rise to unimaginable types of applications. We cannot even imagine today how it's going to be affected. Granted, there are challenges. Granted, there are challenges to be solved. There were challenges when the internet started. Similar challenges in a much bigger magnitude are, are, are getting challenged. Is there is security, there is reliability, all these challenges have to be overcome. And a very smart and secure world is yet to be built really on the internet. We are just getting, this is just the tip of the iceberg now. Yeah, as the Chinese proverb says, may you live in interesting times. With the, with the way this uh, IoT is happening, we are living in one. Ladies and gentlemen, in 10 to 15 years from now, you will turn back and say, I was there at that time. At that time, the internet took a turn to IoT. And I'm proud that uh, I'm glad we were able to share this uh, few minutes. Thank you. I'll be happy to take questions. Yes, sir. Yeah. So uh, with respect to the devices we have, so how much of uh, those devices are intelligent? Like how much they are self-adaptive? Uh, Very good point. So the, the question was, if you didn't hear, um, the devices that we are using for monitoring things, how much of intelligence is embedded in them, how much of either their intelligence or dumb, that's, that's the question. So the, uh, we have had uh, various uh, uh, designs or uh, trade-offs in the intelligence of the devices. Let me explain that, how we make the trade-offs. In many systems, it is important to have a strike a balance between the complexity of the edge devices and the intelligence that you embed in the edge devices. As you, in some cases, if you want to do a real-time 
uh, response at the edge device, you need to have some intelligence at the edge device. At the same time, if you complicate the edge device too much, it is prone to failure. Okay? So it really depends on the applications that you're trying to build. In, in a, for example, a thermostat may all be doing is just monitoring the temperature. That's one way of thinking about it. But if the same thermostat has to respond in real time to changes in the weather, that's the next level of complexity. How much intelligence you put in, how much uh, control you put in, it really depends on the applications. In all the applications that we talked about, the sensors could be completely dumb. Their sensors could respond to uh, very, very real-time actions, and it could take some actions immediately, even without the uh, interference from the uh, remote control. So it really depends on the applications and the context. And most of them are the two-way communications, or is it mostly one way that's from the device to the job? Most of them are two-way communication. Uh, particularly in the industrial sector, uh, we have designed them for two-way communication. And there's a very important reason for that. As I mentioned, there are concepts of device configuration, device management, uh, reliability, all these things require two-way communication. And uh, that, again, goes back to the discussion about what type of protocol do you use, what is the latency, how you are controlling this, how is the backend designed for that. So there's, a, there's another complicated topic uh, around that as well. All right. Question. Sorry. So, um, does Nimble actually customize these devices for you to plug in the first part, So, do you actually customize and create the devices for the for your customers, or do you take standard sensors or that's off the market? So, do like do the complete. We, we do the complete system. Okay. We design, we own the sensors um, that are going into these uh, systems. Uh, the, if, if it is available off the shelf, we can definitely use some of these systems. Uh, but many of the complex cases that I talked about require real uh, hardware engineering to right. get the right form factor, which is why we control the technology all the way from the front end to the back end. Uh, we, of course, we do rely on some of the open source software stacks that are available. Um, in, but in any cases, uh, it is important, as I mentioned, uh, it is important to have the control, complete understanding of the system and have, be, have the ability to uh, design it appropriately for a particular application. And so, yes, we do design the entire hardware as well as the software stacks. Sorry. Uh, so you spoke about uh, B2B uh, use cases. Uh, what's your view on the business model on uh, B2C by bringing these devices to the end user? Sure. How they are adapting it. For example, you can easily approach a construction company and uh, persuade them to use your devices in their new home as a home automation system. But how to bring these to existing users, bring as customers? Very good question. So the dynamics between B2B and B2C are fundamentally different, obviously, you know this. So, the examples are already there. You have probably heard about Nest Thermostat, some of the GPS tracker that Sussi talked about, baby monitors, there is uh, intelligent security systems, intelligent locks, and so on. So even in the case of the uh, B2C, the, I believe the problem that is going to be solved has to be a real problem, a real value-added problem. Something, this looks cool, so let me do it, usually doesn't work, or at least Maybe, maybe it may be a stepping stone to something later, but the B2C needs to have a very clear business case. And also the, uh, the cost points and how, they, how it integrates with their life or with their daily routine has to be taken care of. Uh, you know, in the case of thermostats and uh, Nest had a very good run on this very successful product. So uh, B2C does have a different type of sales cycle, different type of product design, different uh, convincing to be made on a uh, thing. But eventually, you have to be able to convince that you're solving a real life problem uh, for that customer. And, uh, what about the uh, security that you use in Nimble for your customers? Sure. So uh, the security is dealt at different layers, at the, at the transmission transport layer, at the uh, protocol layer, at the application layer, and the backend layer. So it's a fairly complicated topic to get into, uh, but uh, just I would answer that the, the security is at a different uh, layer as a combination of which. And it also depends on types of system that you're trying to build uh, and how we are, uh, there are many tools to work on that, uh, but there is no, 
uh, one common, one simple answer as, as we would have it in a common internet world today. How is IoT shaping up in uh, ensuring social equality? Is there any application to have seen in social sector or it is empowering the people? Right. So, um, empowering the people is happening in many ways. Okay. Uh, as much as uh, the, uh, particularly I have a case study where, uh, of another company, what they did was uh, in uh, places like uh, Kenya, Uganda, and some of those African countries, they had this problem of smoke-filled cooking, you know, the, the, the ovens that are being a huge amount of smoke. This nonprofit organization, actually, this was funded by uh, Bill Gates Foundation, and they went in and uh, created a uh, system of carbon credits where they gave them tools to monitor their uh, carbon consumption and how much they are doing it, and then they can exchange it for some incentives. So there are some interesting examples of IoT being applied for social entrepreneurship or social equality and things like that. Uh, but there are a huge amount of, uh, I, I think there are uh, enormous opportunities in that area as well. You know, as you said, Twitter is causing revolutions in some places of the world, and IoT is definitely going to bring in some of the values. I've heard uh, cases where uh, farmers are getting more information about their, um, uh, about their uh, planning. Uh, there is uh, John Deere, the uh, farming equipment company, has come up with IoT systems where they can with pinpoint accuracy, they can enable the uh, uh, productivity of their farming equipment. So there are many interesting cases there as well. Yes. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So we, uh, we hear uh, many things about connected vehicle, uh, the driverless car. Yes. So is it going to be reality or it's uh, it is still in uh, you know wave stage? Where, where are we standing uh, on the reality? Well, I believe it's going to be reality. Let's meet another 10, 15 years and we'll talk about it again. Um, you know, when, when you suddenly talk about driverless car and thinking about driverless car in OMR, I'm not sure. <laughs> All right, and then you have driverless car in a T another, I'm not sure. I just don't know. I mean, Google says that they have a fantastic algorithm running behind it. But you know what? It's going to change. I mean, it, it's such a profound change uh, that uh, there are a lot of plans afoot today in the car manufacturer. They're running trials. They're trying to figure out what is what is happening. They're trying to learn from it. It will take some time to embrace that change. It is a, such a bold change to give up the wheels, give up, give up the controls of the wheels, but I think it will happen. Uh, that, at least that's my, I know of many initiatives around the world around the connected cars, and uh, connected cars is one thing, driverless cars is a slightly different topic, uh, but connected cars definitely is going to happen. It's already there. Driverless car may take a little bit more uh, uh, ability to embrace change, but I think it will eventually be there. It may be in a limited fashion or, or, or in roadways that are built specifically for that with different controls, but I think it's going to happen. Well, that's just time check. Alright, I'll, I'll be around. We can talk more. Um, sure. Just one last question. So the, the case studies that you showed normally, you know, uh, there are interesting case studies, especially, uh, you know, given the, uh, the state level and the, within the country. So, uh, since you're talking about internet and, and we're talking about sensors and we're talking about remote places, uh, definitely internet, what we saw, especially from a bandwidth and availability perspective, has definitely come a long distance. But still there are, uh, you know, uh, challenges there. So. If you can throw some light on, you know, what were the challenges that you had, especially, uh, you know, tracking devices uh, which are in a remote place where there is no connectivity, and uh, uh, we can talk about satellite connectivity, and you know, that's also not uh, feasible for every company to be provided. So, how did you? What What were those kind of challenges, and how did you come over them? Right. Good question. So, there were a lot of challenges, particularly in the places that we were dealing with, uh, where our carrier would say, oh, I have 99.9% .9 uptime of my carrier, believe me, it is not there. So we had to deal with it in a couple of different ways. As I mentioned, when the connectivity is not there, we would embed intelligence in the device to take some remedial action right there, even without connect uh, depending on the connectivity. Or you could have other techniques in the hardware where it, uh, it, it delays the transmission or it does some kind of uh, you know, uh, fault tolerance systems that could provide. But there is extreme cases where connectivity could fail for three or four days. And this has happened before. 
And in those cases, we still have to think about what would be the uh, remedial action in that. But you could extend this argu argument even further, say, no connectivity, what are we going to do? Sorry, it's not going to happen. But you have to start with the assumption that the connectivity is going to be there for most of the time at least, and for the minimal amount that is not going to be there, you can compensate with some of the techniques that I just talked about. So but that's a very good question to uh, understand that goes into the reliability of the system, and it is we should not be trying to build foolproof systems, rather build fault-tolerant systems. And that's true for many of the engineering projects. So it is, any time we think about we, we spend a lot of time thinking about what could fail, actually, in addition to how it needs to work. The, the rationale behind that question is especially because we're talking about analytics, right? So right. If the data is uh, it's not in, it doesn't reach uh, to the to the source I mean, to the analytical systems on time. It's it's no no use of having such data. So that's. That's true. That's the rationale behind why. That's true. That, that particular problem of data not available within a particular time has been dealt with even before IoT was born. You know, in, in, in the cases of uh, training systems where uh, internet inherently is a uh, is, is a bit, is kind of a, a, multi, a statistical multiplex system at, at the lo lowest layer of the networks, you could still have different delays in the internet as it comes through. So there are techniques to deal with that in uh, in the backend systems, so how we can uh, deal for delays on it. But you're right, that's a very important fact to consider. All right, uh, I think I'm running out of time. I'll be around uh, for a couple more hours so we can talk. Um, thank you very much for uh, sharing this point. All right.